This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. Chapter 18, IAS 12, Income Taxes. Those first nine or so bullet points on the first page of Chapter 18 actually do pretty much say it all. Page 95 of the OT Notes. Current tax should normally be charged, recognised in the Statement of Comprehensive Income, except if it relates to a gain or loss which was previously been recognised in equity. Dividend income and interest and other similar income should be grossed up for withholding tax, but that also means that the tax charge should be increased by the same amount. Income and expenses included in arriving at profit before tax are on an accruals basis, but the taxman often works on a cash basis. So current tax should be calculated on using tax rates and laws which have been enacted or substantially enacted by the date of the Statement of Financial Position. The tax charge and the Statement of Income often bears little relationship to the profit before tax figure in the Statement of Income. In fact, there have been past exam questions where some investor or potential investor has written and said how come the tax figure in the cash flow and the tax figure in the income statement are not the same and how come neither of them is the tax rate as applied to the profit before tax at this level at f7 level i think it's important that you have a, a basic understanding a basic appreciation of the principles of deferred tax it's only occasionally that steve scott examines deferred tax, but if he does, it, it tends not to be too difficult to question. He'll often give you the tax base and he'll give you the book value. And to simplify it to its basic elements, the simple way to do it is to look at the tax base, compare it with the book value, and whatever the difference is, multiply by the tax rate. Just very, very occasionally you'll ask a 10 or a 15 mark question where you have to actually calculate the uh, the tax figure. So getting back to the bullet points, the differences between these two sets of rules may be permanent differences or they may be temporary differences. If we look at these differences in greater detail, permanent differences arise where certain items are included within the income statement and they're either not taxable or they're not allowable for tax. An example, for instance, would be entertaining expenditure, certainly in the UK. Temporary differences arise where there are differences between the carrying value of assets or liabilities in the statement of financial position compared with their value for tax purposes, their tax base or their tax written down value. Deferred tax is the tax attributable to these temporary differences. Temporary differences may be taxable or deductible. And deductible temporary differences, or tax, I'm sorry, tax and did. Oh, Chris, go back one minute. Chris, 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 go back one minute. <coughs> temporary differences may be taxable or deductible. Taxable differences give rise to a deferred tax liability which we'll have to pay in the future, whereas deductible taxable different temporary differences give rise to a deferred tax asset in the future. Just considering these temporary differences a little bit, temp taxable temporary differences can be short-term or long-term differences, for example arising on the revaluation of assets. These timing differences arise where financial statement items are taxable, but they're recognised for tax reasons in periods other than the financial statement period, for instance, or because of the taxman often working on a cash basis rather than on an accruals basis. And for example, interest received is included in financial statements on an accruals basis, but for tax purposes it's recognised on a cash or on a receipts basis. The temporary difference is the difference between interest recognised in the statement of income and interest actually received. Just have a look at example one. Have a look at Yurgita's profit from operations before her royalty income. It's 700,000 a year. And she, in 2004 she's entitled to a one-off royalty receipt of 
60,000 which she eventually receives. So a profit from operations is 700, a royalty income in 2004 is 60, 25% on taxable profits is 175. 25% of taxable profits. Taxable profits are 700. So 25% of that is 175. And 190. Our taxable profits in 2005 are the 700 plus the 60. Uh, so 760 will be her taxable profits. It's this 700 plus this 60. To give us 760 taxable at 25% is 190. Now if I'm going to put this 60 over here, and then a taxable profit over on this side, I just 700. And 700 at 25% gives us this 175 there. But we do have, therefore, the complication of the fact that we have included royalty income correctly in the year to which it relates, but the taxman doesn't or will charge that as a taxable profit in the next year. So show how the entity will provide for the temporary taxable difference. Well, I think we're happy, aren't we, with the, the 700 taxable profits, the current tax, so the 60 royalty, 760, the current tax is 175 but there's also a deferred tax liability and the deferred tax liability is going to be this 60 although we've accounted for the 60 in this year we've not taxed it in this year we've only taxed and calculated current tax on the taxable profits of 700 but we do know that we shall have to pay tax on this 60 and we'll have to pay it in 2005 so 60 at 25 percent is 15 and that's our deferred tax liability so debit the income statement 15 and credit the deferred tax liability and that will give me 190 off that 570 therefore will be my profit after tax in the next year again i've got 700 and this time I've no royalty income, so 700, but my taxable profits are now 700 plus the 60 at 25%, and that gives me 190. So 190 is there for my current tax, but I've no need for this 15 deferred tax liability, so I can release the liability. Debit, therefore, deferred tax liability, and credit the income statement through the tax charge, that's 525 profit after tax for this second year. We move down, temporary differences continue. Temporary differences also arise where the capital allowances rate or tax depreciation rate differs from the accounting depreciation rate applied to the same asset. If we didn't have standardized capital allowance rates, then there would be no consistency or standardization within sets of financial statements. Some people may charge 50% reducing balance, whereas another company could be charging 25% straight line. There's no consistency. It will be extremely difficult for the revenue service to calculate tax, having to change their rules for each individual company. So depreciation is not an allowable expense. It therefore needs to be added back in the tax computation. But instead, the taxman does give us capital allowances. You'll know this if you've already done F6 paper. And tax allowances, the capital allowances allowed to us by the taxman, tend to be at a standard rate of 25% reducing balance, but just occasionally there is a, a situation where, for instance, in the question Andres, there's a first year tax allowance of 100% in order to stimulate investment in new assets. We have the situation here with 040506. Now we can do a total column as well. And profit before depreciation we're told is 1.8, 2.3, and 2.5, which gives us 4, 8, 5, 8, 6.6. .6. And then we've got the depreciation. Depreciation is, um, 
depreciation is useful life for three years scrapped at the end of its life so it's 200,000 uh, three years useful life 200,000 200,000 600 depreciation gives me six million two three two one and one six then we've got the current tax well, we need a working for that. We'll also have deferred tax, and we'll also need a working for that. So current tax and deferred tax working. I'm going to have to squeeze this in up here. 04, current tax. Profit before depreciation is 1.8. And then we've got tax allowances, this 100% allowances of 600 gives me 1.2 and 1.2 at 25 percent is 300 similarly we've got 2.3 before depreciation and then there's no tax allowances because we've used them all here so 2.3 at 25 percent is 575 and on the same basis, 2,500 with no allowances gives me 2,500 taxable. 25% is 625. So that's my current tax. 300. 575. And 625, which adds up to 11, 12, 1,500. So now we've got the deferred tax implications as well. So I'm going to get rid of this because I need to do a deferred tax calculation. Okay, deferred tax. We've got the book value because we're depreciating at the rate of 200. So the book value at the end of 04 is 400. The book value at the end of 05 is 200. The book value at the end of 06 is zero. But that needs to be compared with the tax value. And the tax value is zero and zero and zero. So there's a difference, a temporary difference of 400, 200 and zero. And it means that I have received 400s worth of tax allowances, 400 basis of tax allowances in advance of the book value being dealt with, being, being recognizing this. So if I apply the tax rate, so these temporary differences, that gives me a liability of 100 and then a redux, reduced liability of 50 and then no liability at the end of the year, the end of 2005. So my deferred tax liability is going to be 100 for 2004, but I can release 50 of that so that in aggregate I'm now only got a deferred tax liability of 50 and then I can release another 50 of it in the final year. So there's no, over the period of time, the life of the asset, these tax differences will cancel out. So now this gives me 1,200 after tax, 625, it's 525, so 1,575. And 575 is 1725. And if I add that through, 1725, 32, 33, 43, 40, 4,500, which is what I would have expected. And we got a deferred tax liability in 04 of 100, deferred tax liability in 05 of 50, and nothing in 06. Okay, let's move on. Because the revaluation increases credited direct to equities, this is the example we're doing. Show how Andres. Yeah. Another type that temporary difference arises. Just this is just above this, so I'll just cross this out. Okay. Another time that temporary differences arise is following a revaluation of an asset. And the difference is the difference between the asset's revalued amount and its tax written down value. Because the revaluation increase is credited direct to equity, the associated deferred tax should also be charged to equity and is therefore not included as part of the tax charge for the year in the statement of comprehensive income. We've got an example here with IA. 
I had purchased a property on 1st of January 93 for 4005 Ten years later, the property has a net book value of 342 and was revalued to four to 600 Tax written down value is 450 so the taxman is not giving us any allowances on this 450 And when, in fact, when eventually we do sell the property, if we do make a profit on it, then clearly we're going to be paying tax on that profit. So, calculate the figure for the revaluation reserve as at 31st December. This will be the net of tax figure for the revaluation reserve. We've got an asset with a book value of, with um, a cost of 450. It's been written down by 108 down to 342 and now it's being revalued to 600. This is the difference in the tax values. This was the original tax written down value. This is now the revalued amount. So we have a difference of 150, and 150 at 25% is 37,500. This is the deferred tax liability. If we do sell it for 600, uh, then we shall have made a profit of uh, 150, and we will have to pay tax of 37,500. So going to the revaluation reserve, we started with 342 book value. We want to revalue it to 600, which is an increase of 258. So that's going to go to revaluation. But so also is this deferred tax liability. So not only will we have 258 in revaluation account, but we'll also have a deduction of 37,500. So 220,500 will now be the revised balance on the revaluation account. Moving on to page 98, deductible timing difference is less common than, deductible than temporary differences. They give rise to a deferred tax asset. Less common than, than taxable temporary differences are the uh, deductible differences which give rise to a deferred tax asset. Uh, so Ilse has a profit from operations of 650. Can you just read the question there? She's got some warranties for tax purposes. The warranties will not be deductible until the entity pays them. And 160,000 claims were actually paid in 2005. Just read the, the question and then we'll have a look at it in a moment. Okay. Profit before warranties for both 04 and 05 was 660. Then there's 160 warranties which we're claiming as an expense in 2004. This gives me 500 for my current tax. However, the taxman is not going to allow me that. So over here we've got the tax working. 660 is the profit. I'm not going to be allowed to claim 160 deduction in 2004. So my tax in 2004 is going to be 25% of 660, which is 165. So current tax is 165. But I do know that I will be able to claim these warranties. I do know that I will get the benefit of these warranties next year on the basis of that's the figure that I'm going to have to pay. So I've got a deferred tax asset. I have 160 at 25 percent, which is 40. So this is going to reduce my taxation charge down to 125, and that will give me 375 profit after tax. In the year 2005, I won't claim any warranties because I've already claimed the 160 in 2004, even though I didn't pay them until 2005. So 660 is therefore looking like my taxable profits. But if I think about it, the tax one is going to allow me this 160 in 2005. So taxable profits are going to fall to 500, and tax on 500 will be 125. But that means I can now release also this asset of 40. Uh, so 40 will credit the deferred tax account and debit the tax charge, debit the income statement to 165 is therefore going to be my tax charge, which gives me 495 
profit after tax. IS-12 requires the use of the full provision method where temporary differences are provided for in full. Based on the principal financial statements for a period should recognize the tax effects of all transactions occurring in the period. Two alternative bases have previously been followed, the flow-through and the partial provision. But it's unlikely, I'm thinking, it's unlikely that Steve Scott is going to be asking you about what were the advantages or the principles of the flow-through method or what's the partial provision method. There's a note or two there. There's a note here about flow-through and a note about the partial provision based on the principle that the deferred tax should only be accounted for to the extent that the differences will reverse in the foreseeable future and will not be replaced. Possible, he might ask for a, a five marker, the reasons for recognizing deferred tax and what are the related disclosure requirements. Well, the reason for recognizing deferred tax Ah, oh, because the accruals concept requires it. It will become a liability eventually. And if it's not recognized, then an overstatement of profit could lead to over-optimistic distributions, a distorted earnings per share and therefore misleading to stakeholders and potential investors, and the fact that shareholders will be under-informed. Disclosure whatever you want. Just imagine there's masses of disclosure including in the IAS, masses and masses, page upon page upon page of disclosure. So in a, an exam situation if Steve Scott ever asks you on what disclosure is required just sit down logically and think to yourself what would I like to know? What would I want to know about this particular matter? I want to know the current tax expense. I'd want to know any adjustments which have been recognized this year to the tax charges from previous periods and tax related to items charged directly to equity, so tax on revaluations. Re Details of deferred tax asset and deferred tax liabilities broken down by the type of temporary difference to which they relate and a reconciliation between accounting profits and taxable profits. There is a lot more disclosure requirements, but I think if you just come and sense, sit down and think, what exactly would I want to know, then that should be sufficient for your purposes in the exam.